And they all center on the endothelium, the inner layer of the artery. Is that healthy or not? And if you don't have inflammation or damage to the endothelium and your arteries are inherently healthy pipes, then the LDL, as you say, falls away to irrelevance. But if you do have a problem with inflammation, insulin resistance, or, or there's a bunch of even arthritis and AIDS, there's a lot of problems that lead to vascular distress. And then for those people, having a higher LDL may complicate it, make things worse. <laughs> Welcome to the Fundamental Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Saladino. This podcast is the result of my relentless search to understand and correct the roots of chronic disease and illness. In this podcast, I will share with you everything I have learned about how to live the most healthy and radical life possible. Thanks for joining me on this journey. What is up, you guys? What is up, all you radical people? Thank you so much for joining me for another week of the Fundamental Health Podcast. If you appreciate this podcast, please leave me a review on iTunes or whatever format you listen to it on. It is doing so awesome. I think we're over 500 reviews now, which is freaking amazing, and we're reaching tons of people. It's in the top 10 every single week in health and medicine. This podcast is my baby, and I love it. Thank you for supporting it. I hope that I can deliver good information here. Also, please check out my website, carnivoremd.com, which is where you can find links to previous podcast episodes. You can find links to my new t-shirt, which says Stay Radical on the front, and you can find links to blog articles, other stuff I'm working on, and you can find links to my book, which is coming out in a few weeks. It's going to be out mid-February. I'm going to have the actual release date for you guys real soon. It's going to be on or about February the 11th. It is called The Carnivore Code. I am holding a copy of it in my hand at this moment, and I am so excited to share it with you all. So stay tuned for that. There will be stuff about that on my website, and there's a link there, thecarnivorecodebook.com, carnivoremd.com. My guest on this week's podcast is none other than the amazing Ivor Cummins. You guys may know him. He has an amazing accent, and it was really fun to talk to him. He is deep, deep, deep in the world of lipids and cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular prevention. He has a biochemical engineering degree and previously spent 25 years as an engineer and has developed a way of thinking, which is engineering. We know so many of the smartest people now in the space are engineers. They're thinking about this systematically. And so much of what we are taught in medical school doesn't think about things from a root cause perspective, which is why I am so excited to have people like Ivor, Dave Feldman on the the podcast. And in this episode, we get into cholesterol, insulin resistance. You guys are going to love this one. Check out Ivor's book, Eat Rich, Live Long. We talk about it all in this show, and you will get so much out of this one. It is such a wealth of knowledge. I am also super, super excited to have a new sponsor for the show. This is Belcampo. These guys are a regenerative farm. You guys know that I am on fire for regenerative agriculture, and I really want the podcast to be sponsored exclusively by regenerative farms in the future, hopefully. So Belcampo is a regenerative farm in Northern California. If you go to their website, belcampo.com, you can see how beautiful the land that they raise their cattle on is. It's 30,000 acres, 30,000 acres of certified organic land upon which they raise certified organic animals at the base of Mount Shasta. It's pretty idyllic. And they're doing regenerative practices, just like white oak pastures. They're moving the cows around. And they also have done life cycle analyses on their animals, looking at carbon emissions and are similarly carbon negative. They've also done what I think is probably one of the cooler things, which is look at the soil. And they can see increasing organic matter in the soil when we are raising animals in this way. And so Belcampo is just doing the work that I think needs to be done, and I am so excited to share them with you guys. They have restaurants in Los Angeles and Southern California. They have a few butcher shops and a restaurant in Santa Monica there that I ate at recently, and I'm going to eat at this week. It's so good. I got the cowboy ribeye. So amazing. They've got restaurants in Northern California, and they've got a restaurant in New York. They've also got online ordering and butcher shops in those cities as well. So check them out, belcampo.com. I really believe, like from the bottom of my heart, that we need to support farms like this, that we will be healthier, that the earth will be healthier, and that this is the incontrovertible argument for the way that animals should be raised that recapitulates, that remembers the wild animal ecosystems of the past. You can check them out, belcampo.com, and you can use the code CARNIVOREMD to get 10% off your order. You guys, this is probably the best meat, some of the best meat I have ever had in my life. Between them and White Oak Pastures, I am in heaven. It is amazing. I'm also going to do a meat camp 
at Belcampo this summer. So stay tuned for that. They have yurts on the property. I want to invite all of you guys to come out and see them. So check out belcampo.com. Use the code CarnivoreMD for 10% off. Tag me. Let me know what you think of their meat, but it is fantastic stuff. It is doing the right things for the planet, the soil, our ecosystems, and our bodies. I love these guys. Show them your support and also show White Oak Pastures your support. You guys know that this farm is one of the first that I got connected with that is doing regenerative agriculture. I love them deeply. Just like Belcampo, they are doing this rotational grazing. They are carbon negative and they have been shown to increase the organic matter in the soil. You guys know this is whiteoakpastures.com. You can also go to the website info.whiteoakpastures.com front slash carnivoremd to see what specials are there. You can use the code carnivoremd on the White Oak Pastures website site for 10% off your first order or carnivore 15 for 15% off whatever things are on special. And I believe there's some good stuff today, this week, this month. I believe they got New York steaks on special. We are also doing the white Oak Chella event at white Oak. You guys, I'm so stoked. May 1st to 3rd. I want to see all of you guys there. And we're going to do another event at Belcampo. Like I said, this summer, I'm going to do a meat camp there, but Belcampo and white Oak are near and dear to my heart. These are the farms that are changing the way agriculture happens. These are the farms, in my opinion, strong opinion, that are producing the best food on the planet. The best food on the planet, the food that nourishes us, that nourishes our families, that increases the amount of soil, organic matter, and that is the key. That is the key to persistence of the human race. So check out belcampo.com, check out whiteoakpastures.com, use the code CARNIVOREMD at both of those spots, and please come to White Oak Chella and stay tuned for details about Belcampo this summer for the meat camp there. These these people, I just love it. I love them. I love what we're doing here. I think my next book is going to be on regenerative agriculture, and I love this movement. It's super exciting stuff, and I think we should support these farms and live it and see it because once you see it, I think you'll never really um, not be as understanding of what is going on there. They are changing things in the best way. This podcast is also sponsored by my people at Ancestral Supplements, www.ancestralsupplements.com. They are guys and gals in Texas crushing it six packs, CrossFit workouts, cold plunges, and they are living the life. They are walking the walk, talking the talk, and they are making these grass-fed, grass-finished organ supplements from New Zealand, which are encapsulated into gelatin capsules. It makes it so easy for those of us when we're traveling or if we can't get organs, if we're not used to the taste of organs, to get the best food on the planet. We get the best meat on the planet from farms like Belcampo and White Oak Pastures. We can get organs from those farms too, and we can get the organs from ancestral supplements encapsulated from beautiful animals living in New Zealand in the idyllic lands of Lord of the Rings, and they have all kinds of great stuff. It makes it so easy and so convenient. People often ask me, what should I do if I can't get organs? I don't like organs, and without a doubt, I always say, try ancestral supplements, and people, there are so many great um, perspectives. There are so many great anecdotes with using the supplements. In fact, on my Instagram, I recently posted something about a woman who was having what looks like a pretty significant histaminergic reaction on her face, histamine reaction, in relation to the lotion she was using. And she used the kidney supplement from Ancestral Supplements, which has DAO, diamine oxidase, and it cleared it up very strikingly. So look at that on my Instagram. The other supplement from Ancestral that I'm super excited about recently is their tallow. It's fat. One of the things that's hard for us to get often on carnivore diets is enough fat or even ketogenic diets or paleo diets. And Ancestral has done the brilliant forward thinking thing of ancestrally, of ancestrally, of encapsulating. I don't know how you would ancestrally encapsulate something, but they're encapsulating tallow into pills. You can chew them. Kids love them. And you're getting these natural fats from animals. I am not a fan of vegetable fats. We should be using animal oils and the animal oils will allow the fat-soluble nutrients to become more available. What we also know is that fat from pastured grass-fed animals like Belcampo, like white oak, and like the cows that are used for ancestral supplements to make the tallow is much higher in vitamin E and other fat-soluble nutrients. So the fat is a nutrient so valuable for us. So check out ancestralsupplements.com. You can use the code SALADINOMD at their Shopify site to get 10% off your order there. They are putting back in what the modern world has left out. I love these guys. I appreciate them so much. And let me know what you guys think about this episode with Ivor Cummins. It's an amazing one. Guess what? LDL does not cause heart disease, and you are about to hear why. Listen after this episode for what is going on with me, my people. All right, we are live. Ivor Cummins, man, it is always a pleasure. Thanks for coming on the podcast, my friend. Not at all, Paul. Pleasure's mine. And, you know... 
sometimes I get Tommy Wood on and I get Tommy Wood's accent and now I get your accent because, and these are always, I think my favorite podcasts when I get to have somebody on that has an amazing accent. So thank you from the bottom of my heart and all of my listeners heart that we get a fun accent for the next hour and a half. Well, I'm always pleased to entertain. (laughs) You know, what's funny is I think that um, what I try to do in the podcast and I don't always succeed in this is actually make it entertaining while being as sciencey as I can. So I hope between you and I will, will, will do our job as entertainers uh, throughout this show. But you know, you and I have had so many good conversations. I was on your podcast a number of months ago talking about the carnivore diet and you and I have collaborated and shared ideas about LDL and cholesterol. And we're going to dig into all of that, but you know, for listeners who are not familiar with you, Tell us a little bit about your background and how the heck you got so interested in cholesterol and heart disease and all of these little little topic rabbit holes. Yeah, well, Paul, I'll keep it pretty short because some people will have heard it before. But basically, I'd say in 2012, I got basic blood tests, routine ones, nothing special. And I had uh, a few markers way out of whack. So my cholesterol was high, of course. Uh, I had serum ferritin which is an iron loading in the blood, and that was very high. And serum gamma glutamyl transferase, GGT, was extremely high, a liver enzyme, which indicates liver challenges. So the doc was there, and I looked at the numbers, and I spent 25 years leading complex problem-solving teams, and I was a biochemical engineer originally from college. So I didn't know what these meant exactly, but I looked at the numbers, and I was so far out of range, I instinctively knew this is a big deal. But the doctor didn't really respond much. I grilled the doc. What do they mean in terms of mortality, morbidity? And B, what lifestyle or factors can affect them? So what can I do? And I got very weak answers. And I was quite shocked because these were standard blood tests. And something niggled at me. How can the doctor not immediately tell me the series of things, like an engineer would, who is specialized in a given area? So I couldn't, that's weird. So I went to a second doctor, more senior person, didn't get much joy either. I mean, I got stuff about lower your fat and more healthy whole grains for the um, cholesterol. Uh, I got a discussion of hemochromatosis for the ferritin, which is an iron loading disease. But I got a test for that and I was negative. And then for the GGT, there were some mumblings about maybe drinking too much wine. But I verified later that wasn't it. So the second guy, no good either. And now I'm beginning to really think there's something big behind the scenes here if they don't have a good grasp. So I went to a third, three strikes, third doctor, very senior, not much better. So I realized then, wow, if three doctors, good good guys, really don't have a grasp of basic blood tests, how can that be? It, It doesn't make sense. They're super smart people. So I went to ResearchGate, PubMed, and I got my corporate logons, and I researched ferritin, cholesterol, GGT, and I went down the root-causing kind of problem-solving path, which I'd done for decades. And it means you don't waste time. You follow the right kind of forks in the road at every point based on the data. And within four or five weeks, to be honest, Paul, it sounds a bit arrogant, but four or five weeks I had carbohydrate metabolism as the primary driver, almost certainly, I learned all about the metabolic syndrome and was shocked that this is a huge disease causing so many modern chronic ailments and no one mentioned it. And I found out cholesterol was so ambiguous, it was probably near worthless. So as you can imagine, I was kind of blown away by these self-taught revelations from the research from the last hundred years of published papers. So I switched to a low carb diet, uh, had no doubt that this was gonna make a dramatic difference. And nine weeks later, my GGT was down in range, my ferritin was down in range, and my cholesterol profiles and ratios, triglycerides, were all dramatically improved. But my LDL went up a little, which, of course, I didn't care in the least about. And anyone who's listened to this podcast will know that we share the same view regarding LDL, which is that we can't interpret it in a vacuum, and we are going to get into that in great detail. Let's just drill down a little bit on some of those labs for people. If people are interested, I've done a whole blood work podcast on my podcast in which I talk about GGT. I talk about gamma glutamyl transferase, which as Ivor suggests is a liver enzyme that is often associated with oxidative stress or some sort of liver stress. 
And then when you say your cholesterol was high, quote unquote, in the beginning, can you give us a sense of what your lipid panel looked like when you had what you believe to have been a metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance syndrome? Right. Well, I'm just going to convert to my head from millimoles to milligrams. Great. Right. You audience. So basically, I was probably around 260 something total in milligrams. Of course. And my LDL was actually, let me just think for, I was almost four. So around 150 or 155 LDL mm -hmm. and maybe around 55 or 58 HDL and triglycerides approximately 130, I think. So again, I'm converting here, but that kind of profile. So my LDL would be seen as quite high. Uh, they've been talking recently of 160 milligrams as being an automatic drug. They're currently at 190 as an automatic uh, lipid lowering drug, regardless of your other risk factors. But they're talking about going to 160. So I was nearly at that level. Uh, and my ratios were not that bad considering how bad my liver enzymes were, but they got way better. And so one of the things that I've talked about on previous podcasts and I talk about in my book is that when someone gives me a traditional lipid panel, like you're, share, like you're sharing, and the numbers, are, the, the numbers are in milligrams per deciliter or in the UK or in Ireland, they're in millimole and you have to convert them by multiplying by what is it like 17, something like that. And yeah, it's something like that. It's one millimole in HDL or LDL or cholesterol. One millimole is 38. And in triglyceride, one millimole is 78 because it's a different molecular weight. So a little trick there. Yeah. So you have to convert those. But when people send me or ask me about cholesterol panels that are in milligrams per deciliter, most of the time it's because their physician has become hyper-focused on that LDL number. And I always say we cannot interpret LDL in a vacuum. And in this podcast, we will talk about why. But when I hear your lipid panel, the first thing I think about is that triglyceride to HDL ratio. And even at that point in your life, your triglyceride to HDL ratio was more than two. It was almost three. And what I recommend to people is that you want your triglyceride to HDL ratio to be less than one. And I, as we'll talk about, I think, and I'll be curious if you agree with this, I think you may, that the triglyceride to HDL ratio is probably the best predictor of cardiovascular disease risk and insulin sensitivity that we can get from just a basic lipid panel. Yeah, the triglyceride over HDL is excellent. Uh, it's still fallible, of course, but it's vastly better than LDL. And I think there's one Harvard study from the 90s, pretty solid perspective study. And between the top quartile and the bottom quarter or quartile of trig over HDL, there was a 16 times risk difference. And we know LDL is a one point something times risk difference. And that's gifted to it by by other things that are going on under the hood. Exactly. And so you had a panel with a high LDL, quote unquote, around 150, and a triglyceride to HDL ratio that was two and a half, which is pretty elevated. Well, yeah. I, I got that wrong. I Again, converting, it was probably more like around 105 milligrams, oh, okay. maybe 60 something uh, HDL. I, I'll check that one, but it wasn't that high. It was maybe 1.4 or so. It wasn't huge. Okay. Mm. And then in the context of that, and this is what I always recommend to people, we have to expand. And this is what I hope the medical system will start doing in the future is not just looking at a lipid panel, but looking at things like ferritin, GGT, HSCRP, which is high sensitivity C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker. And as we will talk about in this podcast, perhaps the granddaddy of them all, measures of insulin sensitivity, which we might consider to be a triumvirate of fasting insulin, C-peptide, and maybe pro-insulin as we'll talk about. And yet, any of those physicians that you talked to, did any of them want to know your HSCRP or your fasting insulin at all? Um Essentially, no. It was a standard panel, and it was even unusual I got GGT. In America, they generally don't do it, but Almost in Ireland, never. they do. No. And I'd have to double-check the original panel. I don't think the CRP was that high, but I'd, I'd have to check back. It certainly didn't come up. Interesting. And what I've seen in my blood work and the blood work of my clients is that if HSCRP is anything above... 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 or 0 0.5, there's something going on. It should be very low 
most of the time. Certainly if we have a cold or the flu or we have an injury, HSCRP can go up. Or if we exercise vigorously the day before, HSCRP can go up. But generally speaking, mm -hmm. we really should see HSCRP rock bottom when we're looking at that marker. And then your ferritin, yeah. how high was your ferritin? The ferritin at the time was the range for humans, the normal range, but of course that includes a lot of people who are not that healthy. In the Irish units for that lab, I think was around maybe 80 or 40 up to 300. Mm -hmm. And I was 520. So I was well above the lab range. And I could see that when I glanced at it. And so if people are interested in hemochromatosis and iron storage, I get a lot of questions about this. I talked about that in my first AMA podcast. You can look back to my fundamental health podcast for that. But as Ivor, uh, as Ivor is suggesting, <laughs> we were joking before the podcast that I've mispronounced his name multiple times. At some point in the podcast, I will make sure to call him Igor just to really piss him off. <laughs> Um, as Ivor is suggesting, um, you were checked for genetic polymorphisms for hemochromatosis and you didn't have those. No, I was completely clear. It wasn't even heterozygous. So that one was out. Now in the world around 0.5 or 0.6% of people have this iron loading where they hyperabsorb from the gut and their iron builds up and it's catastrophic. Uh, but it, you, Irish extraction people could be 1.5% or more. So it is kind of known as the Irish disease, the iron loading disease. So it was a fair chance I could have it, but no, I, I was clear of that. And then you made a change. You decreased, what kind of dietary changes did you make at that time? You kind of hinted at this. You went lower carb, but tell us, break that down for us a little bit. What changes did you make? Okay, so I was eating what I thought was a healthy diet. You know, it was food pyramid fare. Uh, plenty of healthy whole grains. I was a big bread liker. And I would have plenty of potatoes, love potatoes, because they're kind of addictive. Uh, also rice, when I had meals, I'd have large amounts of rice soaked in the juices and the gravy. So I had a lot of that kind of supposedly healthy complex carbohydrates. And the bread we bought was whole grain bre bread as well. Like we wouldn't really buy the white wonder bread. So I would eat otherwise meat and vegetables, normal Irish dinners. And I wasn't really, um, I guess the main thing I was eating was a lot of carb that I realized as I discovered that carbohydrate metabolism was the likely primary problem. I realized how much carbohydrate I was eating. And also, I didn't think too much about eating milk chocolate here and there. And one other key thing I was shocked at afterwards, I loved orange juice and I had been greatly influenced by the five a day message. And it was clearly said that orange juice, you know, fresh squeezed, which is now available in, in quart jugs relatively cheaply, it is essentially one of your five a day. So I used to drink a lot of orange juice because I thought this is great. Um, so that was another key thing. And I wasn't careful with sugar intake, really. I, was not a, I didn't take sugar in my tea or coffee so much, but I just wasn't worried about the sugar content of any foods. It didn't bother me. I was conscious of fat. I felt guilty when I was eating bacon and there was fat on the edge and I liked it. And then I, th I used to think I should cut it off or fatty lamb, which is great in Ireland. I used to cut away fat and I was conscious this is going to clog your arteries. And that was my whole adult life. So when I switched the diet, no surprise to many people listening, I cut out all the rice, cut out the potatoes, cut out all the breads essentially. And I began to fill my diet with meat, fish, eggs, and above ground vegetables, you know, broccoli, cauliflower, fine. And I cut out the sweets and sugar like milk chocolate, switched to dark chocolate, uh, 85%. And the orange juice was gone immediately. I was actually quite shocked as I studied the liver metabolism of fructose, et cetera, at the time. And I just could not believe I was drinking a lot of orange juice. It's a liver, a liver buster. So I switched over to a classic low carb diet, but then I discovered within a few weeks something magical. I realized my hunger had collapsed away. So I'd been overweight for many years, even when I was doing triathlon training, I was really big and chunky. My appetite transformed within the first couple of weeks and I began to skip meals because my weight was dropping, which was nice. People in work were noticing within two weeks 
And then I wanted to accelerate it. And I now found out I could because I wasn't hungry. So I accelerated it. I actually added fasting without thinking about it. Long story short, in eight and a half, nine weeks, I dropped over 30 pounds. You know, and it wasn't hard. And also my blood pressure, which was always 140, 145 over 90, unless I was doing a lot of training and there was talk of medications, that collapsed long before the weight. And this was a key point for me. I had a home test kit and within a week or 10 days, it was rapidly dropping on average. And that was before the weight loss really kicked in, which later on I understood because it's a metabolic problem. It's not a, a adipose tissue problem. You know? Yes, blood pressure problems, hypertension is a, fascinating, is a fascinating pathology. And I think so many people don't realize that in the majority of people, hypertension is insulin resistance. And it's an indicator of insulin resistance. And as you talk about in your book, which I was reviewing before, which is Eat Rich, Live Long. It's amazing. People should definitely check it out. Um, the, as we know, traditionally, when we think about metabolic syndrome, one of the criteria is hypertension. The other criteria are low HDL, hip to waist circumference, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, metabolic dyslipidemia. But hypertension is a criteria for metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is previously called syndrome X and there's nothing uh, amazing about it. Like an X man, it's a very bad X. It's the bad kind of X and it is an indication of insulin resistance and hypertension. I think until proven otherwise is insulin resistance. But in my training, when I was a PA wow. in residency, et cetera, we never said to people when they had hypertension, we never said, let's check you for diabetes. Let's check you for metabolic syndrome. Let's check you for, uh, let's check you for insulin resistance. I never in my training was asked to get a fasting insulin or a fasting blood glucose necessarily on somebody with hypertension. But in fact, the majority of people who have hypertension have insulin resistance. And so not surprising that in your case, and we can kind of break this down a little bit more, you had insulin resistance. And when you removed that by making this change in your diet, hypertension goes away. Yeah, and it goes away quickly because if you strike hard with the correct diet fix, the root cause fix, then things happen quite rapidly, uh, long before the weight can slowly seep away. But you're absolutely right. The hypertension is a beautiful marker for insulin resistance. I have several doctor friends, and I can quote this because they said it, not me. They said that idiopathic hypertension, meaning without any known cause or defined cause, it just means the guy looking at it is an idiot <laughs> because he doesn't understand what you just said. But the tragedy is, Paul, right now in medical school, I'm sure it's not much better. I don't think it is. And, you know, mm. I worked as a PA in cardiology before I went to medical school and did my residency. And every day when people had hypertension, we thought ACE inhibitor, angiotensin receptor blocker, thiazide diuretic, et cetera, et cetera, calcium channel blockers, amlodipine are very common now. And as you've mentioned a few times, why are we not looking for the root cause of these things? That's what my podcast is all about. That's why I sort of named it Fundamental Health. That's been my obsession. And for people to know, hypertension is reversible and it's insulin resistance until proven otherwise. So uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, and just tying back to the doctors I went to, uh, two of them I stayed in contact with and the middle guy did note that he was seeing serum ferritin getting higher and higher, particularly in middle-aged men over the last 30 years of his practice. And he was always wondering why that was because they were negative for hemochromatosis. And a few weeks later, when I'd done my initial research, I actually went back and told him why. So how, he was delighted to get the insight. How much did your ferritin go down with that change? The 512 or 520 or 512, I know there was a two in there. It went down to the high 200s mm -hmm. within the eight or nine weeks. And that was within range at the time. So I was fine with it. Now you could argue you should go to get your ferritin much lower. And that's a very tricky topic because we have people in their 60s with really high ferritin and they have zero CAC scores. So while it's a great indicator of metabolic syndrome or properly insulin resistance syndrome. It's, I think there's many cases where it's not really reflecting metabolic syndrome and it's just that person's physiology runs a higher ferritin. So I find it a bit ambiguous. GGT less so. 
Ferritin is a tricky one because mm. if people have heard the previous podcasts I've done discussing ferritin, specifically the blood work podcast, ferritin is what we call an acute phase reactant. So ferritin is a storage form of iron in our cells. There's a storage form of iron in the blood and there's a storage form of iron in our cells. And ferritin is the storage form of iron in our cells. And if we get iron overload, if we have hemochromatosis or if we have something else that's causing iron overload, ferritin will go up. But ferritin mm -hmm. can also be raised by inflammation and ferritin will track with inflammatory markers like HSCRP, GGT, or ESR, which is erythrocyte sedimentation rate. So ferritin can track with all of these markers and can indicate inflammation, or in your case, it can indicate insulin resistance. So it doesn't always in indicate iron mm -hmm. overload. Now, one of the th questions I get a lot, uh, eating a carnivore diet, talking about a carnivore diet, talking about animal-based diets, talking about carnivore-ish diets is, aren't you going to get iron overload? And generally speaking, the answer is no, because if people do not have this polymorphism in the hemochromatosis gene, specifically HFE, uh, which is an iron transporter in the gut, they tend to sort of, their ferritin goes up and then it tends to plateau is what I've observed. And yeah. I see a lot of people whose ferritins are in the 200s. Once the ferritin starts to go above 200 or 300, I think, huh, this is where we get into the gray area that you're talking about. The patients I see, the clients I see are not insulin resistant based on the other markers I'm doing in their blood work. So I don't think it's that. I can look to see if they have inflammation. I don't think it's that. And I look to see if they have hemochromatosis genes. There are a number of them that people can have more than just the single one. So if someone has any of the polymorphisms that may increase iron absorption and the ferritin goes above 300 or 400, I might suggest, um, I might suggest something like, like phlebotomy, therapeutic phlebotomy, but it's pretty yeah. rare. And as you're suggesting, I think that the, the story is not cut and dry here. And it's interesting that you have cases of people with zero CAC scores, which is a coronary artery calcium score. We can talk about that, uh, who mm -hmm. have high ferritins. So it's not necessarily cut and dry. And I don't think people should fear heme iron in meat. It's a very nutritious source of iron in general. But if ferritin is elevated, just like we, I think that the take home message here is, all the blood work has to be interpreted in context. And so much of what we do in Western medicine that needs to improve is looking at markers in, uh, in, in, in hyper-focus. We look at them myopically, whether it's LDL or, you know, we have to look at the context and see how they all fit together. Absolutely. And in any other complex technical systems, that's exactly what happens. I mean, you imagine in aircraft design or aircraft investigation, every interaction amongst myriad variables is always looked at and, and balanced out. But in medicine, they've kind of just gone down this hole where one or two big markers they run after willy-nilly, almost like they left their brains at home. Yeah. And this is why I so appreciate engineers like you, Dave Feldman, and my buddy Nathan Owens in the space because they help us doctors, you know, people who have not been taught to think in the same way. I think that all physicians, I think in medical school, there should be an engineering course or some sort of like how to freaking think about your patient, how to think about the root cause of an illness, because we never get that training in medical school. As Ken Berry has said, really what medical school is about, and this has been my experience, perhaps it hasn't been everyone's experience, but so many of the doctors I've talked to corroborate this. Medical school is about how to identify a disease, and how to know which pill to give. There's never a course in medical school called critical thinking, and that's why you guys are so valuable to our community. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Yeah, well, it also is fascinating for us because it's a whole sphere where there's huge value. It's about human life and death and tragedy or avoiding tragedy and living long and strong. I mean, huge prizes compared to just manufacturing widgets. Uh, and they've left the field wide open for the reason you say, if they were highly competent and had all the markers and all the science locked down, it'd all be sorted out. But it's wide open because there's so many absurdities in the field. So it makes it a, an incredible one to jump into. I mean, if you take the absurdities, people uh, who push hard on, on LDL, it can be a marker. And if it goes very high in the new diet, you've got to verify with all the other markers. There's nothing sinister because it can be a proxy for an underlying problem. Okay. But then you get those people, and you mentioned FH earlier, 
We have a family now, and this is just one of many examples uh, from Asim Malhotra, where sisters and a brother in their 60s with lifelong mega LDL, as in from memory around 350 LDL alone milligrams. Two of them with zero CAC and the third one same, but also got an angio for other reasons and was clear. So if you take that and you take that the Katavan people, or it might be the Semaine, have same or higher LDL particle count than Americans, but they have no heart disease at all, and Americans are riddled, even those couple of facts I just threw out, I'd like to get the LDL guys in a room and lock the door until they come out with an explanation for that. And they won't. They don't really answer that challenge. They just avoid. Because how can you answer it? It's, this is the thing that I've talked with Dave about and why I was so excited mm -hmm. to have this conversation with you. Speaking of absurdities, yes, let's dive into LDL. And I just want to clarify some of the things you were talking about there. For people that want to have more background on lipids, please listen to the first two podcasts that I did with Dave Feldman and one I did with Nadir Ali. Um, all of that can serve as great background information for all this discussion. But LDL is low-density lipoprotein. It's one of the lipoproteins that moves throughout our body. It's a remnant type of, not really a remnant per se, but the liver makes VLDL, which turns into IDL, which turns into LDL. The liver is exporting triglycerides and cholesterol in VLDL, very low density lipoprotein particles. And it, it's like a bus that moves out of the liver and it becomes IDL, intermediate density lipoprotein and LDL, low density lipoprotein, as it moves through the body, delivering precious, valuable cargo. And it has been so hyper zeroed in on, right? It, there's so much myopic focus on LDL. And this is one of the great things that I am so excited about really uh, helping people understand is not a big deal because often on, as you suggested, low carbohydrate diets that might even be ketogenic, LDL can rise. Certainly on a carnivore diet, LDL can rise. And I don't think this should be an impediment to people doing that diet because in your case, you clearly got metabolically healthier so many of your metrics improved and your LDL went up. And so we can't hyper-focus on LDL. And I love these points that you're making. Let's just clarify for people as well. FH is familial hypercholesterolemia. It's a model system for elevated levels of LDL, which really shouldn't be a model system because it's a genetic polymorphism that causes people's serum LDL to be very high. There are over 2,000 polymorphisms that can cause uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. I think that technically the medical establishment would call it a mutation because it's a, uh, a felt to be a pathological change, but that's neither here nor there. But there are so many, many of these mutations are in the LDL receptor on the liver, but they can be other places as well. So familial hypercholesterolemia represents a group of people that are, it's a small fraction of the population, but they are very heterogeneous in terms of the genetic underpinnings of their high LDL. And proponents of the LDL theory of atherosclerosis, which posits that LDL is number one, enough to initiate an atherosclerotic plaque, and therefore should be eliminated or pushed as low as possible, will point to FH because in people with familial hypercholesterolemia, there are certain cases in which a higher LDL is associated with more uh, cardiovascular disease. But as you suggest, and as you suggest in the book, if we look across people with familial hypercholesterolemia in general, there is no difference in the incidence of cardio cardiovascular disease uh, given for a given level of LDL in those people. It's not clear that um, that LDL is directly even tied to cardiovascular disease directly in them. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, well, actually, what occurs to me, Paul, is one study I found in the last year. Now, we put eight or nine FH studies, I think, in the book, in the appendix, illustrating what, what we're talking about here. But one came up more recently, and it was very good because they tracked FH people over a long period. And they looked at what caused them to have risk because they had ones that were in their 50s and 60s with no heart disease and ones that had a lot. So they kind of matched them and they said, well, what's different between the guys who check out early and the, and the guys who are perfectly fine? And they and all had they elevated was, LDL. Well, they're all elevated LDL. Yeah, this yeah. is the beauty. Yeah. So they're all elevated LDL, but some of them are perfectly heart healthy 
and some of them then do get a what appears like a very early heart attack. Okay, well, what's the difference? And what they found, it, the risk multipliers is what they looked at, or hazard ratios. So just for people, if you have a two times uh, risk multiplier, then being high in some variable gives you double the risk. Okay, so double's a big risk, triple's a very big risk. And what they found out was that low HDL was something like a six to eight times risk towards having an early heart attack for these FH people. And then they had hypertension was in the same range. High blood pressure, you were six to eight times more likely to be one of the guys with an early heart attack. These are huge risk multipliers, but they're just the normal multipliers that ordinary people have. And then it went down until LDL, the higher LDL people within that fifth FH group, it was only a 1.16 multiplier for risk to be much higher LDL within the group. In other words, being higher in the LDL within the FH had really nothing to do with whether you had an early heart attack or not as an FH person. It was all low HDL and hypertension and other risk factors. So the other thing in that paper that was really interesting was they separated out the standard FH with an LDL around four or five or sorry, I'm in millimoles, with around 200. And they separated them out from the extreme FH, who had an LDL around 400 plus. And they looked at the difference in outcomes, and there was really very little difference. Again, even between LDL 200 and LDL 400, there was almost no difference in the survival curves. So if people think about this, it's a stunning result because we're asked to believe that a 130 or 40 LDL is okay, but an FH person with a 200, right, which is up around 50%, is that really high risk? But then an FH person who has 400 is similar to the 200 guy in terms of risk. So you can just tell it's not the LDL that's mediating or deciding the early heart attack. It's the other risk factors. And I think the best thing you can say about FH, they may be genetically susceptible to heart disease and they may be much more sensitive to the normal root causes that we all are subjected to, but they, they may go down much harder. So genetically susceptible, but it's not really the LDL that's driving the bus. But I will agree with you, Paul, the LDL people love FH because it's a simple and untrue message. Oh, they have higher LDL and that's why they have problems, you know? And I love that you highlighted this, the risk multipliers that you cite, hypertension, low HDL, these are indicators of insulin resistance, <laughs> insulin resistance. And this, this, this theme comes through in your book and I love this. And this is something that I talk about in my book coming out next month. I wrote a whole chapter on LDL and, and we collaborated on a graphic that I used in the book. So thank you for that. And the, um, the, the take home message here for people, which we will continue to elaborate on in this podcast is that LDL cannot be interpreted in a vacuum. If we really look at the studies, it's not clear that there's a linear directly correlated relationship between LDL level and the incidence of coronary disease. There's another risk multiplier the context is everything, and that context is insulin resistance. And we can see that. One of the studies that you shared with me that I put in the book was this Framingham study. And in the Framingham study, they looked at LDL, levels of LDL versus incidence or relative risk of cardiovascular disease. And if you take the population in the Framingham study, which is a large epidemiology study from Northeastern United States, as a whole, there is a relationship between LDL and cardiovascular disease. But if you break that cohort down by HDL, right? If you break it down by HDL and you take one line, it's the same data, and you separate it into four lines, what you find is that the people with the highest level of HDL, presumably people who have an indication of insulin sensitivity, have essentially no correlation between LDL and cardiovascular disease, while those with high HDL, or excuse me, low HDL, have a curve that's much steeper, and there is a very good correlation between LDL and cardiovascular disease. So I think what Ivor and I are saying is not that LDL is not involved in atherosclerosis, but mm -hmm. it is not initiating it, and it is not the only factor. As you suggest, LDL is playing a role. I think LDL gets wrapped up in the ball of wax. You know, LDL gets pulled yeah. into the, to the melee, 
And so in people who are insulin resistant, if you have more LDL, you may have more fuel for the fire, but it's the insulin resistance that provide that is the total overarching context. And I believe it's the insulin resistance that is the spark that burns the, the wood. You know, you can store a bunch of wood in your garage. It's not going to spontaneously combust unless lightning hits it. And that lightning strike is the insulin resistance. And so I think in some people with uh, familial hypercholesterolemia or some people with higher LDL, if they have that spark, man, that, that LDL can go up in a blaze and it can become, you know, aggressive atherosclerosis. But without the initiating event, which is, I think most listeners will understand, is the most important piece of this equation, the LDL is just there doing its job, which is valuable, right? Yeah, and that's a great straightforward analogy to it, the fuel for the fire. And you know what? There's insulin resistance is a huge problem and whatever drives it. But then there's other inflammatory conditions and they all center on the endothelium, the inner layer of the artery. Is that healthy or not? And if you don't have inflammation or damage to the endothelium and your arteries are inherently healthy pipes, then the LDL, as you say, falls away to irrelevance. But if you do have a problem with inflammation, insulin resistance, or, or there's a bunch of even arthritis and AIDS, there's a lot of problems that lead to vascular distress. And then for those people, having a higher LDL may complicate it, make things worse. But in an engineering sense, they're not the real root cause, or the LDL is not the real root cause. It's an interacting peripheral variable. The real root causes are what offend the archery. Exactly. And there's a long list. Let's go through it, because I think that's a great segue to the next part of this conversation. One of the things that I've heard said about LDL, which really I find to be quite striking, is that if LDL were in fact enough to initiate atherosclerosis, the formation of plaque in the artery wall on its own, why do we only see plaque in arteries and not veins, right? They have the exact same vascular structure they made. They're made of an endothelium, below which is an intima layer, below which is a muscular layer, and a smooth muscle layer, below which is the adventitia, which is the surrounding part of a blood vessel through which blood vessels run to supply the muscular wall of a blood vessel. And so, veins and arteries are essentially constructed in the same way. Arteries have a little bit thicker muscular layer, but veins have the exact same histology. They have the exact same microscopic appearance, but we never see atherosclerosis in veins unless we take a vein and we, um, and we transplant it into the arterial circulation. People may be familiar with coronary artery bypass or cabbage surgery, in which a popliteal vein from behind the knee is often used to serve as a reroute around a blocked artery. And what happens very quickly once a vein is in the arterial circulation is that that vein now develops atherosclerosis very fast. In fact, usually faster than an artery because it's under a high pressure. So as you're suggesting, and this may be a great segue, what I have seen is that arteries develop atherosclerosis because they're subject to high pressure. And we often see atherosclerosis at branch points where there's turbulence, and that turbulence can sometimes damage the artery wall. So I'll let you take over here, but I love this idea that the artery wall probably has to be damaged for this process to initiate in the first place. Yeah, Paul, I'd agree, or offended in some manner. And... Um... Oh, where do you start with that? Yeah, atherosclerosis is focal. So certainly the veins don't get it. And when you transplant them, like you say, they burn up really fast. But it's focal, so it happens intensely in certain areas of the arterial pipe. So there might be a big atheroma on one side of the artery and across the lumen on the other wall, there isn't really anything at all. So it's very focalized. And we see that it happens at branch points you know, where there's stress raisers. Uh, the glycocalyx we talked about earlier is thinned at branch points. So that's a, an inner lining of the artery, like, a, ser like a, a hairy forest that protects the inner lining, the endothelium, and that thins out. The endothelial cells at the branch points also are more misaligned and less contiguous or joined together perfectly. And you get turbulence, as you mentioned. So when you have good shear flow uh, in a straight section of archery, 
all the signaling through the glycocalyx, forest of hairs layer, triggers nitric oxide and keeps vasodilation, expansion of the artery working properly. And then when you get to junctions where you have turbulence, that those mechanisms don't work so well. So a load of the reasons for the focal nature of atherosclerosis or why it occurs in certain spots speak to endothelial compromise. But you're right, none of them speak to LDL because LDL is the same concentration everywhere. In the whole body, the, the arterial mm. and the venous circulation is contiguous. Yeah. Now, there is one that's maybe it's a stretch. I'm putting together a podcast. I did an interview with Vladimir Subotin in CrossFit last December. I went over to their conference, and he has a whole different hypothesis. So I'm okay with the orthodox hypothesis that LDLs can somehow get into the endothelium, the inner wall, and build up in the intima. I'm, in principle, I, I accept that, but I always do talks to explain why it's still not the LDL's fault, right? It's the glycocalyx being damaged. It's the endothelial cells uh, being damaged or compromised. It's many other things, but it's not the LDL's cause. However, Subotin would propose the reason why it's in arteries and not veins primarily is the vasovasorum. So these are tiny arteries that feed the wall of big uh, muscular arteries, and they don't occur in veins. Vasovasorum, little arterioles that feed the wall of the big arteries, they only happen in the arteries and the coronary arteries. And what's more, atheroma are only really found where there's vasovasorum and never when they're not. So Subotin would propose that again, it is an insult to the intima or the inner lining that causes it to uh, swell or hyperplasia, that the cells begin to turn over faster and your inner layer of the artery gets thicker and then it gets hypoxic because as it gets thicker, the nutrients in the blood can't flow into the deepest layers. And that brings in all these little arteries automatically to grow the vasovasorum and start feeding into the intima to give it nutrients. And they bring in inflammatory molecules, red blood cells, and a load of stuff. So Subotin has this other whole theory, but it's, I'm probably going down a hole now bringing up that one. <laughs> no, I, I researched that one when I was writing my book as well. And so what we're talking about here is that the mainstream quote unquote theory of atherosclerosis, which is referred to as the response to retention hypothesis, posits that LDL enters into the intima, which is the layer of cells below the endothelium from the bloodstream. And, yeah. and what Vladimir is suggesting is that LDL might also be entering the arterial wall from the other side of the artery, which is the adventitial layer that I was talking about, through which runs the vasovasorum, which means vessels within vessels. And what's so maybe so confusing for people here is that at a microscopic level in the arterial wall, so an artery is a blood vessel, blood is moving through the blood vessel, but in the wall of that blood vessel, because it is so thick and muscular, we have more blood vessels in the wall of the blood vessel. <laughs> so there's yeah. different layers of magnification here. And what, what is being suggested with this I don't know that it's alternative, I think it might be a complementary hypothesis, is that some LDL might be delivered to the intimal space from the other side of the blood vessel and it gets stuck there. What, what I kind of came up with when I was writing the book is that, and, and I'll be curious on your take on this, is that LDL, I, I, everything I could find, both from your work and other work that I was looking at, was that LDL probably moves through the endothelium into the intima in a normal process. That's probably a normal process of LDL moving in. It, it, it has to deliver things. We know that there is, there is uh, endocytosis, there is transcytosis, which is an active process, that things move through there, but then they probably move back out. And so what was fascinating to me was why does some get stuck, right? Why does some get stuck on that proteoglycan layer, which is a layer of proteins in the intima? There's like a stickiness. So in the book, I suggest that atherosclerosis might be triggered by stickiness of the LDL and stickiness of the intima layer. 
because if LDL is always moving into that intima and then moving back out, which it appears to be, some of the sort of LDL tennis balls get coated in Velcro and they get stuck there. And what, there's good evidence that uh, in states of insulin resistance, LDL is enriched in ApoC3, which is a molecule that makes it a little stickier. It's a, an apolipoprotein that goes into the membrane of LDL. And then the proteoglycan layer in the intima also looks like it could be getting stickier, more charged, and maybe more retaining of that LDL in the intima layer. But I think at a very basic level, at a very broad strokes level, what we see clearly is that insulin resistance is the determiner. You know, insulin resistance is the switch there, and something about LDL, something about the intimal space changes when people become insulin resistant. And it's maybe it's coming from both the endothelial side and the arterial, you know, the vasovasorum side, and it's kind of getting stuck in that little layer. But the take home point for people here is it's not the LDL's fault, right? LDL on its own is not enough to do this. And the reason that we keep emphasizing this so much is because look, as, as happened with Ivor, as has happened with many people in this space, when we uh, change our diet, if LDL rises, but we're getting quote healthier, it's not something to worry about. If we're not insulin resistant, if there's no inflammation, then we shouldn't get so hyper-focused on LDL. We're, we'll chase the wrong thing, right? Well, yeah, that's, that's it. A good summary. And um, essentially, I gave a lecture on this and put five layers between your blood and the bottom of the intima. And those five layers are the root causes of why LDL may come from your blood and get stuck and get oxidized deep in the intima. And just basically, one of them is oxidized LDL in the plasma in your bloodstream that has been proven to damage endothelial cells and cause death and turnover. Uh, the other layer is the glycocalyx, proven to be damaged by blood sugar spikes and insulin resistance and many other things like smoking. And then so you've the got glycocalyx, the just so people know, I'll pause you there. Just so people know, as you mentioned, people may not be familiar with the glycocalyx. I'm miming with my fingers like a little forest. <laughs> right? People are watching the video, I'm miming. So this is super important. People may not even know. You mentioned this, but I just want to highlight it. There is a forest of glycoproteins that is, that is connected to our endothelium on the inside of a blood vessel. There's also a forest of glycoproteins on the inside of our guts called the glycocalyx. So there's a glycocalyx in your gut and the gut also has an endothelium. These structures are very analogous, except in your mm -hmm. gut, it's fecal matter, in your blood, in your blood vessels, it's blood, but they have an endothelium upon which a glycocalyx is protruding. And I just wanna to emphasize to people, as you're saying there, and I've talked about this before on other podcasts with Tommy Wood, these mean amplitude glucose excursions, these postprandial glucose spikes that can happen for people, these are known to damage the endothelium, right? Or damage the glycocalyx. Absolutely, damage the glycocalyx. And that's a great description there verbally, especially for people listening. But I can send a link after as well. There's a 20 minute sequence. I gave the talk in low carb Houston and low carb Mallorca where I go through all the layers with big graphics, very clearly explained. So anyone who's interested, can get, I think, a very, very simplified explanation. So your glycocalyx, you've got oxidized LDL, you've got the endothelium single cell layer on the inside of your artery. Uh, that can be compromised. Same old root causes, insulin resistance, smoking, inflammatory drivers. Uh, and then the retention, that's another place where you can have a problem. And you're absolutely right. As you say, see APOC3. Uh, one lovely experiment they did in an animal model is they got type one diabetic mice and they had wild type healthy mice. And they actually saw eight times the retention of LDL in their uh, experimental setup in the diabetic mice. And of course, insulin resistance and tying to APOC3. So even the retention aspect is not driven by LDL, it's driven by the other things we're talking about. So at every layer of the orthodox theory of LDL, retention in the intima, every single layer that mediates or controls that is not to do with LDL, it's to do with all the other root causes. So even by their own theory, you can dismantle it completely. And then when you add in subotin, you can then create a whole new hypothesis. And I agree, Paul, it's complementary. 
Uh, the only other thing I'd say is the orthodox retention theory from the blood side and subaltans that it's all starting from the adventitia. Uh, the, re, the thing that subaltans suggested was they accept the vasovasorum bringing in inflammatory products and bringing in LDL for every stage of atherosclerosis except for the start. So there is lots of uh, literature out there absolutely saying without question the vasovasorum are a massive driver of all the stages of atherosclerosis up to the vulnerable, most vulnerable plaque that give you the heart attack. They accept it. The only thing they won't accept is it's also the first step. <laughs> so it's interesting. It's kind of silly. And so we've touched on oxidized LDL. Let's talk about that a little bit so people know. Uh, people can get this on sophisticated lipid panels. One of the things that I've talked to Dave Feldman about, which is pretty fascinating, is that oxidized LDL by, in most panels is just a proxy for LDL particle number. So there aren't a lot of great tests for oxidized LDL that I'm aware of because it does track. Um, I do think oxidized LDL is playing a role. I don't think we have a great test for it. And, and in my clients, I pretty much what I've come to use clinically is a ratio of oxidized LDL to LDL particle number rather than absolute oxidized LDL because it makes sense that uh, if you have more LDL particles, if you have more LDLP, as you may on a ketogenic, low-carb carnivore diet, your oxidized LDL is usually going to go up. But if that ratio changes and there's more oxidized LDL per LDL particle, that gets to be a problem for me. And the ratio that I like to see is 0.04, less than 0.04. And that's probably based on uh, over 100 NMR lipid panels I've looked at in people with elevated LDLP and oxidized LDL. So some people may be above 0.04 oxidized LDL to LDLP, but if there are that, and that starts to kind of raise my eyebrows and I think, why do you have more in the ratio? But we were talking about a very interesting study that I want to share with the listener because this relates to saturated fat. So tell me your views on saturated fat, and then I will talk about this study looking at saturated fat and oxidized LDL. Right. Well, from the very early days, saturated fat, my research could not go come up with any convincing evidence against it. So I think it was completely confounded uh, with high saturated fat in a modern westernized diet, which also had high sugar and refined carb. And when you put the two together, like a lot of fats and saturated fat with a lot of refined carb, and everyone's eating a ton of refined carb now, even if it's bread and pasta and they think it's healthy whole grain, it's refined carb. So the combination is not good, and I accept that. In the absence of refined carbohydrate and, and spiking of insulin, the saturated fat should be metabolized beautifully in most people. The only caveat, and I know we've chatted on this before, and I'm going to have Dr. Stephen Gundry on the podcast, hopefully in the next few weeks, is the APOE4 genotype. So people who are APOE4 and have sustained heart disease, metabolic damage, insulin resistance. They may, based on data that Gundry and others have collected, have possibly developed a sensitivity to rich protein as saturated fat animal foods, but maybe more particularly cheeses, possibly through an immune reaction. So I think it's fair to say with LDL rising on a diet a lot, like you and I agree, almost certainly it's no problem if your other markers are all good and you know what you're doing, but people can still take a diet that, that moderates that because it's their personal decision whether they want to take risk. And likewise with APOE4, who have heart disease or a high calcium score, which is essentially the best measure of heart disease you can get, well, if they see inflammatory markers going up or, or unusual or anything worrying, they can have a diet where they back off a little on the saturated fat and certainly the cheese. And that would be a good choice for them because it's their life and their risk. They have to take responsibility. But, but outside of that caveat that we can never be 100% sure of everything and make absolutely unequivocal statements, broadly speaking, for any healthy, metabolically healthy human, with the good markers, as you say, when you triangulate them all and there's nothing except a higher LDL, there is really no evidence for, for a fat problem. There's enormous evidence for a vegetable oil and refined carb problem.
Exactly. And we can get into that too. So if people are interested, I actually did a debate with Stephen Gundry, which is on my YouTube channel. It was a number of months ago. And I also did a whole podcast on ApoE4 with my brilliant friend, Tommy Wood, and people can listen to that. The takeaway from the ApoE4 podcast that I had with Tommy Wood was, I'm going to sound like a broken record. It's only a problem in the setting of insulin resistance. And as you and I talked about prior to the podcast, Ivor, there are populations of people who are indigenous people in which the Simane and the Nigerian Yoruba, I talk about this in my book as well, in who ApoE4 polymorphisms are protective uh, as they age in terms of cognitive function. And we also had talked about prior to this podcast today, a case study that people may have heard me discuss in my podcast with Will Cole. They can go back and listen to that one on inflammation in which a heterozygous patient, a patient having one copy of ApoE4, who had uh, early onset mild dementia with what we call a low score on a MOCA, a Montreal assessment of cognitive function. Uh, So this patient had mild dementia. They had one copy of ApoE4. They were placed on a high fat, high saturated fat ketogenic diet. Insulin resistance improved markedly and cognitive function improved markedly. So for me, it's, it's definitely not clear that ApoE4 and saturated fat don't go together at all. But what appears to be the case is that ApoE4 is our ancestral genotype of ApoE. It's the one that's been around for the majority of our evolution. ApoE3 arose about 200,000 years ago, ApoE2 about 80,000 years ago. And so for our entire evolution as humans, the majority of it at least, we, had, we were all ApoE4. And what it appears to have happened is that ApoE4 is particularly bad in the wrong context. I, my suspicion, my hypothesis is that people who have ApoE4 are particularly susceptible to cognitive decline and other issues when they become insulin resistant, right? That's the chink in their armor. And so this is what's so hard and why we need people like engineers to help us think about this properly. If we think about it broadly, it looks like ApoE4 is bad, but really it's all about context. And as we're showing, People, there are free living people on the earth who have ApoE4 who are thriving in an ancestral context and they're not insulin resistant. It's actually protective as it probably was for our entire evolution. ApoE4 appears to be protective against parasitic and infectious insults. But what, it, what looks like it's happening is that ApoE4 is uniquely uh, badly suited for our current environment of insulin resistance. And so again, it's kind of like LDL. It's not the ApoE4 that's the problem. It's our current lifestyle that's the problem. And people with ApoE4 are particularly susceptible to our bad lifestyle. So that changes everything. And that's why saturated fat can look bad in ApoE4. But again, those are just epidemiology studies because who eats more saturated fat? People who are doing more bad behaviors. I think you could do a study that would show that if you look at the, across the population, the more saturated fat people eat, the more insulin resistance they get. And that confounds all of these studies, right? It's not the saturated fat, it's the insulin resistance from the other behaviors. And I love that you point this out as well. Not all saturated fat is created equal, in my opinion, perhaps yours as well. I am not a fan of dairy fat. Dairy fat does look inflammatory for some people. On the first podcast I did with Tommy Wood, I talked about this as well. Tommy is concerned that in some people who have dysbiosis or the wrong type of organisms in the gut, putting a whole bunch of saturated fat in the gut, especially saturated fat from dairy, can cause lipid rafts to form and move endotoxin across the uh, the gut lining. But again, it's not the saturated fat per se, it's the dysbiosis. So a lot of this is contextual. Overall, I am not really a fan of dairy. I think for some people it can work, but it can be triggering, but dairy fat in my opinion, is not the same as grass-fed animal fat, not the same as well-raised pork fat, not the same as trimmings from white oak pastures, et cetera, et cetera. So what do you think of all that? Whoa, here we go. Uh, No, very good. And you know what resonates, Paul, because, well, Tommy is fantastic uh, for, for, for one. But also a Gabor Erdosi, I recently talked in some detail around the gut and this whole gut fuss. And he brought up those very mechanisms that the fat can bring across endotoxins. Uh, So if you've got a proper microbiome and you've been a long time on a low carb diet, no refined carb, no issues, good microbiome, the fat won't necessarily 
perform that function or be problematic. However, if you're a insulin resistant or diabetic, APOE4, and you have sustained metabolic damage and you may have dysbiosis as well, then you may see signals with saturated fat and it's something to be careful with. But I agree, particularly my instinct is the dairy probably dominates. And in fairness to Stephen Gundry, he's generally with his patients, it's not just epidemiology, though I agree that's totally confusing, but he has actually a lot of patients where they introduce these foods and they actually get inflammatory markers to move in a non-ideal fashion. And my own uh, sponsor, David Bobbitt, who's APOE4 with a huge calcification score, is really careful. He sees the same when he moves his diet. And With dairy. even though that response is there, I think Gundry did freely admit that he has not separated out the fatty cheeses from the animal meats or fatty meats. So, so they're a little confounded. They're stuck together. What would be really great is to take ApoE4 people with metabolic histories of issues, high calcium scores, and then separate out eating a lot of cheese, measuring inflammatory markers subsequently, and then just say animal fat or healthy grass reared, you know, steak or lamb, uh, and tease this one out. Uh, I'm not, it's going to be hard to do though. The devil's in the details. I think we, we already see this happening clinically. It's just a matter of getting a study to, to prove it. Anecdote can be misleading, but my clinical suspicion is that you're, you're absolutely right here and there's some nuance. So I just well, want to point I, out, yeah, go ahead. Well, if I could just make one point actually that I always agree with, with David, my sponsor, he's put four or $5 million into this philanthrop philanthropic effort to get the message out in the calcium scan. And another big thing he has is the APOE4 message that the people who are most at risk of heart disease are APOE4 statistically. And then they also probably have sensitivities as we described. So his view on it, and it's a fair view, is the people who, are, who have the most to lose uh, have to be the most careful. So while we work out all the answers, always let them know they can play safe until we have all the data and tweak their diet away from the potentially problematic because they're the ones with the highest risk and they should not be, you know, trying to find this out for themselves. So I just think it's a good extra point to make and leave it to the, uh, the less at risk to, to discover all this and, and tease it out. Well, I think all of us can just check our inflammatory markers. Even people with yeah. ABV4 can just watch triglyceride HDL ratio, fasting insulin. I mean, we have metrics. We have the, you know, we know how to pop the hood now. We're not perfect, but gosh, we can be pretty sophisticated. You know, somebody can make a dietary change with APOE4. We can watch fasting insulin, C-peptide, HSCRP, ferritin, GGT, you know, triglyceride HDL ratio, all these things, CAC, et cetera, and say, oh, things are going in the wrong direction. Let's, let's back off, right? Well, or or it's have, fine and you feel good. If they have you as a doctor, you know, and they're well-informed, but I suppose... His concern would be more the masses, the masses who just hear it's fine to eat all the fat you want and maybe not be as discerning or knowledgeable as you say. But I suppose that's the caveat. Uh, but as time goes on, low carb is getting big, keto is getting big, the message is getting out in spite of negative media reports and, and corporate pressure to suppress this, if you will. And with time, I think this will resolve itself because the whole world will finally realize we were sold a complete pile of junk science and that low carbon keto and proper real foods, including grass fed meats and well reared meats are just the general way to go. And then we'll, we'll fix some of this stuff. And you brought up a point earlier that I'll, I'll reiterate for the, for the listener the combination of fat and carbohydrate is uniquely uh, insulin resistance creating. And I don't think it creates insulin resistance per se, but one of the themes that I've come across a lot recently, and this has to do with biochemistry and the Randall cycle and the way that insulin resistance actually works in the body, is that if we combine fat and carbohydrates, and the source of the carbohydrates matters, but generally speaking, if we combine fat and carbohydrates, if we overeat on fat and carbohydrates, that is if we exceed our calories that are needed for normal metabolism, 
if it's a combination of fat and carbohydrates, we will become insulin resistant. That appears to be the case. Mm. And so when we limit carbohydrates or limit fat, we can kind of take away that biochemical fire, right? Because, uh, there are overfeeding experiments with carbohydrates that are quite interesting that don't seem to be quite as bad as you would think, but they're in a low fat context and there are overfeeding experiments with protein and, and fat. Um, uh, did I say fat or carbs? Anyway, there are overfeeding experiments with fat and overfeeding experiments with carbs that don't look to be uh, terribly bad in isolation. But when we combine them and people overfeed with both, we know that inflammatory markers and insulin resistance develops pretty quickly. And why would we overeat fat and carbs together generally because we're eating junk food and it's made that way because that combination short circuits our satiety mechanisms. And you talk about this in the book a little bit, that fat sensitizes the body to the actions of insulin through GIP. Do you want to mention that for a second? Oh, yeah, GIP. Again, Gabor Dolce, we had great uh, discussions on this years ago. But GIP is a hormone in your upper digestive tract, and it's called glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide. So long word, but basically glucose-dependent. So it's primarily a trigger that when glucose and sugar comes in your mouth and into your stomach, there are sweet sensor receptors in your stomach, these sensors G, uh, release GIP hormone in your upper intestine. And basically, when your insulin spikes up, when you eat something sugary, it's not actually the sugar hitting your blood that releases most of the insulin. It's GIP that streaks out and tells your pancreas to start releasing insulin before the sugar even gets into your bloodstream. So GIP triggers insulin and it's a major trigger. And then there's some other triggers too. But that GIP, if some papers, it's potentiated, the response of GIP is potentiated or mediated by fat with the glucose. So when you put the two together, there's an even greater response. And you know what? It makes sense because the body knows some bad shit is coming down. Sorry, shouldn't <laughs> curse. And, and basically the incretins, which these hormones are, are properly sending the signal, hey, sugar and fat coming together and they're spiking insulin even more to take care of this challenge. So that GIP is up high and lower down you have GLP and uh, glucagon-like polypeptide. And the GLP is the one you do want to spike. So that has anti-diabetic effects. It spikes up when you get whole foods that have moved all the way down your digestive system, remaining somewhat intact. Then there's a higher triggering of GLP and other hormones down low, and they uh, cause satiety signals. PYY is down there too, down deep. So think you want to eat food that makes its way all the way down your small intestine. The last thing you want to eat is food like sugars and refined fats that explodes the GIP up high in your intestine and causes insulin spikes and all of this craziness. And they did some great human studies. And like you say, it doesn't have to be a perfect low-carb diet. They gave people a standard American diet and they looked at GIP and GLP. And then they gave a kind of a mostly plant-based low-fat diet with lots of roughage and lots of, you know, bulk, but real foods, vegetables, not cereals and grains. And they saw the GIP go right down in the following weeks and GLP, the lower good one, goes right up. So it can be done with a more plant-based diet just by eating a lot of real foods instead of refined foods and getting a lot of the food to work its way down to your system like it would have for those high-ish carb indigenous peoples eating real unprocessed foods. And you can also do it with low carb. So a long story, but basically GIP up here, don't hit it with sugar and fat. You know, get real low carb, high fat, high healthy fat foods or a choice of real food diets that work its way down. Don't trigger GIP too much and trigger GLP and PYY, trigger satiety, trigger anti-diabetic hormones elsewhere. So that's kind of the story. I love it. That's so interesting. And it, it brings me back to the problems with orange juice, right? Orange juice oh. is horrible. 
it's just going to super trigger GIP and heaven forbid that you eat anything fat with orange juice. You are eating bacon with orange juice. You're going to get so much GIP. You're going to get this hyperinsulinemic response. And this actually harkens back to something Tommy and I have talked about, which is refined fats. In the paleo, in the carnivore, in ketogenic movements, a lot of people are eating a lot of liquid fat. And I wonder if this could be a problem because mm. Like, like I've talked about and what Tommy has recommended when I've talked to him is I prefer personally, I've found that I feel much better when I eat non-processed fat. These are things like tallow or suet, excuse me, not tallow necessarily, but trimmings or suet, which are fat encased in connective tissue. This is the fat that you would find on a ribeye, a fat that you would find on a piece of bacon, as opposed to drippings or rendered fat, which we often call tallow, the liquid fats like butter or ghee. These are going to hit our gut right away. And I wonder if it may have to do with the foods that we eat with those, but I wonder if they're going to trigger GIP. It will probably depend what kind of macronutrient ratios we're eating with that liquid fat. But you could imagine a situation in which if you are eating carbohydrates with liquid fat versus carbohydrates with real fat, quote unquote, trimmings, suet, the actual fat that is from an animal rather than being rendered that those fats would trigger these incretin hormones differently. And I don't recommend tallow to people for that reason. I don't recommend processed carbohydrates either, but it's a great, it's really a great emphasis on the fact that real food, whether it's plant or animal origin, rather than ground up, you know, processed, separated foods are going to trigger our satiety hormones in the proper way. And if we are eating liquid fat, that's probably not the best thing. I don't, I'm not a fan of butter. I'm not a fan of ghee. I'm not a fan of liquid tallow. I'm not a fan of olive oil, Stephen Gundry, nor am I a fan of, uh, of bulletproof coffee for those reasons. We're giving ourselves a big bolus. Now, here's an interesting question for you, and then we'll move on from this topic. My impression is that these incretin hormones can also be triggered by things which are sweet, but not glucose. And so a lot of these keto snacks, keto cookies, or fat bombs, they're gonna have erythritol, sorbitol, they're gonna have sugar alcohols. You know, some people are now using glycine as a sweetener. These are not glucose, but they are sweet. And my impression is that they can still trigger these incretin hormones in a negative way. What do you think? Yeah, well, that's an interesting one and it's controversial. Uh, I've been extremely busy the last year with my main job. And I haven't tried to delve into that one. And I've only curse, uh, taken cursory glances at papers. And my impression is, without delving in too deep, I see a lot of contradiction out there. I'm just surprised no one has sent me or I haven't found a simple human experiment demonstrating it. Because it shouldn't be too hard. And I've seen ones where it indicates that and other ones where it indicates that there isn't much response with, with sweet uh, things that are not really glucose. Uh, so I'm not sure, uh, but I would certainly agree that this whole keto habit of eating all of these keto snacks and kind of low sugar chocolates and cakes, and it's not good because the whole message we must have is low carb or keto real foods. And let's be honest, you know, you're stretching way beyond real natural foods, ancestral foods when you're using all these modern components to make basically loads of snacks. Now, I think they might help someone who is finding it difficult to leave behind all the crap they used to eat, but it should be seen as a bridge maybe. Um, I don't think you want to keep that bridge. It keeps the whole behavior and habit of snacks and cakes and bars in your life. And I think the people who get away from that junk and get to enjoy with fasting, especially. I fast sometimes one meal a day and at most two. But I know I'm going to enjoy that real food meal. I'm going to savor it. But if you start eating all these snacks and crap, it's, it just doesn't resonate with me psychologically as well as, you know, metabolically. Mm. Physiologically, it's a problem. Awesome. Mm. So I want to circle back to saturated fat for a moment. We went down a little rabbit hole there. But as we were talking about with saturated fat, I found this great study, uh, which is not a new study. It's from 2004. I talk about this one in the book. The title of the study is Changes in Dietary Fat Intake Alter Plasma Levels of Oxidized LDL and Lipoprotein Little A. The listener may be familiar with the, uh, the fact that 
LP little a, lipoprotein little a is something that's been correlated with cardiovascular disease risk, though that is a complex equation. And if you heard the podcast that I've done with Dave Feldman, we, I don't think we know everything about LP little a at this point. It seems to be a genetic thing. Some people have higher levels, some people have lower levels. LP little a seems to track with LDL particle number. Um, but generally speaking, in any given individual, the, the mainstream consensus would be that more LP little a is not usually a good thing. LP little a is a lipoprotein that actually is an LDL molecule with a little apolipoprotein little a attached to it. And it may have a role in cleaning up oxidized phospholipids from the body. But in this study, changes in dietary fat intake alter plasma levels of oxidized low density lipoprotein and lipoprotein little a. There were two groups of people, 37 healthy women. They were fed two diets. And what both diets reduced saturated fat intake from 28 grams to 20 grams. And the amount of polyunsaturated fat intake increased from 11 to, uh, from 11 to 19 grams. So polyunsaturated fat went up quite a bit because 19 grams of PUFA, polyunsaturated fat, is a lot. And they decreased saturated fat by about 30%. And so what did they find in this study? In both groups, one group ate a lot of vegetables, one group ate a small amount of vegetables. So that's the second intervention. But both groups decreased saturated fat, increased PUFA. In both groups, levels of oxidized LDL and levels of LP little a went up went up, meaning that as saturated fat was removed from the diet, as PUFA, polyunsaturated fat, and in fact, these PUFAs are probably HUFAs, as you talk about in your book, highly unsaturated fatty acids. So we got PUFA, MUFA, HUFA, right? And so these polyunsaturated fats that were increased in the diet, this enriches polyunsaturated fatty acids in the LDL particle, and this has been demonstrated multiple times, LDL enriched with linoleic acid, which is an omega-6, it's a PUFA, um, this is more susceptible to oxidation. This is exactly what they found in the study. What happens when you do this? LDL will go down if you decrease saturated fat and increase PUFA. But in this study, oxidized LDL went up, LP little a went up. How do we explain that? Well, more of it's getting oxidized because these are fragile uh, molecules of fat. And decreasing saturated fat in this case looks like a really bad thing. What do you think about that one? Yeah, I remember that one. I think from memory, we dropped it into the book somewhere. I think in an appendix where we went deeper into this whole poly situation. Uh, and we also quoted Kate Shanahan, Dr. Kate Shanahan's book, Deep Nutrition, which I found a great resource illustrating things like you mentioned earlier, like several percent of canola oil uh, is actually essentially a form of trans fat. Five percent. Um, or five percent, exactly. So she has a lot of detail. She's deep dived in this. But yeah, I'd agree. Excessive poly, uh, the traditional ancestral diet was around one percent uh, linoleic acid approximately. And now our average diet with modern processed foods and all these vegetable oils is around 10%. So we're 10 times. Uh, it clear in the literature shows that omega-6 fats and PUVAs are needed and they're essentials. And they reckon the threshold you need is somewhere like half a percent of your diet is plenty. 1% is what we got at random over a million years. And now we're 10%. The, some of the research on this is stunning. We know we've seen human trials where it apparently shows a benefit in heart disease over a few years. But remember, eating more PUFA may mitigate metabolic syndrome in the short to medium term, a medium term, and may give you a slight improvement. But in the long term, there's countless negative implications. We even at one trial with extra polyunsaturates instead of saturated fat, and the heart disease went down a little, mortality, but the overall mortality didn't change. And that team, I think it was the veteran study, a year later quietly published a paper indicating that the cancer mortality had gone up and that's why it canceled out the heart disease reduction. So there's a lot of connections and, and animal experiments relating to the oxidizing of, of these PUFAs in the 90s that clearly showed an impact on um, carcinogenesis and mammary carcinogenesis. We put a good few of those in the appendix and everyone ignored them. 
But they showed that at 1% linoleic, which is the ancestral, there was no effect on carcinogenesis and on acceleration, you know, in tumor encrusted rats. And they showed that two or three or 4% then, you got an increase in cancer's rate of growth. And after three or 4% linoleic in the diet, if you kept bringing it up to 10 or 12, it didn't get worse. So what was interesting there is, if three or 4% is too much really, and we have everyone at between six and 14% now, you're not even gonna see a signal in epidemiology between linoleic acid and, and cancer because everyone's above the threshold. And you could go on about the other trials as well. Uh, there's one that was done multiple times in rats. They infused the rats with alcohol 24 hours a day, right? Happy rats. <laughs> and then they tested them with beef tallow in the diet with uh, pork, I think it was, yeah, maybe three or 4% linoleic and sunflower, 20%. And they showed without question that they could not cause liver damage. We all know how fundamental liver is. So this is a great indicator. They could not cause liver damage in the rat when it was on beef tallow. When it was on three or 4% linoleic with the pork fats and some added linoleic, I think, they got very dramatic liver damage with the same amount of alcohol and the sunflower was just off the scale. So they basically titled the paper, linoleic acid is required for liver damage from alcohol in our animal model. Not even that it makes it worse, but you require above 1% to even get liver damage from alcohol. So we could go on, but there's so much science around the problems with these fats, but because the orthodoxy sold them as heart healthy, all of that's ignored. The human trials that backfired, like the Sydney Heart, the Minnesota, the Helsinki Businessman's Trial, not, not one many people know about, they're all ignored. I mean, what do you reckon, Paul? The negative evidence is all ignored, and a few weak trials are exalted. This is what is so tricky about what we do, right? Is helping people understand the entirety of the evidence and the fact that people can choose whatever study they want and ignore all the other ones. So it's pretty crazy. But, you know, I, I've, I'm struck with the thought as you're saying that in a way, I think that in order to, in, in addition to constructing a diet which creates insulin resist, insulin sensitivity for humans, we should be looking to create a low linoleic acid diet and not a zero linoleic acid diet, which no. would basically be impossible. You know, there is some small amount of linoleic acid in grass fed animal meat. Um, but as you suggest, we only need about 0.5% in our diet to get enough. It's an essential fatty acid, but we don't need a lot. And just like anything else, too much causes major, major problems. And so I think we should be creating low linoleic acid diets and we should all know how much linoleic acid is in our diet. One of the things I do with my clients is I'll do a fatty acid analysis. You talk about the omega-3 index in the book, which is the sum of DPA, DHA, and EPA, the omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 has to do with where in relation to the carboxy terminus of a fatty acid, the first unsaturation point is. And an omega-6 fatty acid has it at the six position. Omega-3 has it at the three position. And basically, I think when I look at that, in addition to showing me the omega-3s, it shows me the omega-6s. And I love seeing low, quote unquote, linoleic acid. I can tell how much linoleic acid is in the cells, specifically usually the red blood cells. There are some omega-3 or fatty acid panels that are serum levels. These are not accurate. You have to do a red blood cell fatty acid panel, and you can look to see in the red blood cell membrane, what percentage is linoleic acid, what percentage is saturated fatty acid, what percentage is omega-3 fatty acid. And I love seeing low linoleic acid. I like seeing it around 18% or less. This is in the membrane, not in the diet. But I think that what we will find is that we should be eating low linoleic acid diets. Where do we get linoleic acid? Generally, it's from nuts and seeds, vegetable oils, things like that. A low linoleic acid diet, the first one that comes to mind is a carnivore diet, but I may be kind of biased. Uh, animal meat, <laughs> yeah, animal meat's pretty darn low in linoleic acid. You're not going to get much. And um, though the, uh, I think the data is conflicting, uh, grass-fed meat will have lower levels of linoleic acid, I believe. 
the other thing I'll mention about that study with saturated fat and oxidized LDL um, and LP little a, as I suggested, there were two groups. So one group ate low vegetables, low fruits and vegetables. The other group ate high fruits and vegetables. And there was no difference between them in the amount, in the change in oxidized LDL and LP little a. This in some ways recapitulates the studies that I've spoken about frequently that when we remove fruit and vegetables from the diet, there are many studies which don't show any changes in oxidative stress markers or inflammatory markers. And in the case of this one, the addition of fruits and vegetables didn't seem to attenuate any of the increase in oxidized LDL or LP little a in these people. That's just an aside. The take home from that study was that decreasing saturated fat, increasing PUFA, increased the amount of oxidized LDL and LP little a. So the flip side of that equation is omega-3. And I think I need to dig more into the omega-3 data, but I am not convinced that humans need tons of omega-3 either. Uh, I think like you said in the book, it's more about the ratio. And if, uh, if we're getting a small amount of omega-6, I don't think we need a ton of omega-3. I suspect that many of the benefits that we see with omega-3 are because it's balancing out this hyper omega-6 consumption in the population. As you suggest, most people are eating 6 to 14% omega-6. Yeah, if you give them a bunch of omega-3, they probably, they probably need that to balance it out. But I am, I am not an advocate for hyper supplementation of omega-3 in the diet. We need some, but again, I think it should come from ancestral sources, whether it's just occasional fish, salmon roe, or grass-fed animal fat and egg yolks. I think that's plenty omega-3. And I have personal concerns that enriching the diet with omega-3 uh, unnaturally will also lead to overoxidation of membranes. And um, I think I've found one study that showed that with omega-3 supplementation, vitamin C levels went down, um, suggesting that vitamin C was being consumed when people were over consuming omega-3. So I am not a fan of over consuming omega-3. Just like omega-6, I think we need it, but I don't think, I do not think it is a panacea. I don't think we should be doing the Rhonda Patrick six grams of omega-3 per day. I think that's ludicrous. Six. Or more. I mean, I, she takes a lot of omega-3. I couldn't quote off the top of my head, but she's always saying she's taking lots and lots of fish oil. Yeah, I, what I do, and I, I'm really, really not that great at, at supplementing. I mean, magnesium and, and cod liver oil is what I use because it's around 10 times lower cost than, than buying the, the capsules. And a very high quality mercury removed uh, cod liver oil, and it's been processed very properly, I think is probably the way to go. But I, I only take a moderate amount, and I think a couple of grams is fine, especially if you're not eating fish. But, but I think, yeah, six grams and all and hypercharging it is kind of the concept, well, if a little is good, more is better. <laughs> I, I agree, though. It's a lot of polyunsaturates you're putting in that may be very beneficial up to a threshold, and hypercharging it, I'd have my concerns. It's a tricky one to really answer for sure, though. You know what's interesting, Paul, and uh, this one really gets me. So there have been many anti-omega-3 uh, reports and publications because I think industry and patented pharmaceutical, they don't like supplements in general. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of negative stuff about supplements always, and I'm sure you've seen that. But recently there was a trial that was published, which showed a compound X, which gave a same or better result than a statin. So like, that's huge. It was something like a 28% reduction in cardiac events. And there was all this excitement, wow. But what that is basically is just omega-3, right? But the difference is instead of giving 0.4 grams omega-3, like when they're using the cheap stuff, non-patented, and then using it in people who are quite sufficient in omega-3 already and they see no effect and they say this is completely useless, they gave, I think, three plus grams of a patented version. But I'm told on good authority, it is no different effectively than standard omega-3. And they got an actual result in a short-term trial. So now there's a lot of uh, hype about omega-3 because now there's a patented version. So, and that means, ironic, that the, isn't it? yeah, then the pharmaceuticals can give it. But let's, I, I love that you said this earlier, context is everything. And yeah. it's like we're undoing the bad things with more omega-3, right? The problem, in my opinion, is not an omega-3 deficiency. It's an excess 
of, well, it's probably both, right? It's an excess of omega-6 and the fact that most people don't even eat real food. So they're not going to, I mean, how many people eat like good pastured egg yolks to get DHA and stuff, right? So that's, that I think is the key. And again, it's, we're, it, they're not looking at it as a root cause analysis. Uh, I don't think that, that, that it's a necessarily an omega-3 deficiency. I don't think people should run out and supplement with omega-3, especially if they have a low linoleic acid diet. Because generally speaking, I think, this is just my feeling, my opinion is that the ideal state would be a balance of omega-3 and omega-6 with the smallest amounts of those that we can get because then there's the less, the smaller amount of oxidizable material in our cell membranes. And I'm not sure exactly what the, what the sweet spot is, but if we only need 0.5% of our diet from omega-6 and we usually get about 2% ancestrally, generally we probably want about a two to one ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 you know, or one to one or who knows, you know, two to one or three to one. If we're getting 2% of our diet from uh, omega-6, we probably only need to get 1% of our calories or 1% of our fat from omega-3. And that's probably just fine. And that's what they're doing, I think, is pushing this ratio up with omega-3 supplements because everybody's getting so much omega-6. And this, it actually, it reminds me of the methionine and glycine studies that were done on mice where they would, where they would pull methionine out of the mice and say, ha ha, they're living longer. And they could do the same thing just by adding glycine to the mice. They don't have to pull methionine out. Right. And people, yeah. this is where, you know, people in the space get worried about methionine. They want to methionine restrict for longevity. And it's like, no, you don't have to restrict methionine. Just give them enough glycine, which we would have gotten ancestrally by eating connected tissue from animals. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the same thing with omega-6 and omega-3. We don't have to give everyone three grams of omega-3 to be healthy, especially listeners in this podcast who have a low linoleic acid diet. They probably don't even need that. But for the general population, I think it is talking about this ratio. But who knows? I, I agree. And ratios are everything. We see it with cholesterol. We see it with methionine and, and glycine. We see it with the omega-3, omega-6. It's always ratios that are important in wider context. And it's never a single magic bullet or magic number. So I agree. And if you take a 2,000 calorie or 2,500 calorie diet, I mean, you're talking a couple of grams of omega-3 by your logic you use there. A couple of grams. You know, it's not huge. And maybe EPA, DHA, you know, those components in brain health and all, you know, taking a little more if you're low in omega-6 particularly, you know, it might not be a, a bad strategy, but a, a little more than your baseline, but not, but not huge amounts more. And I know there's a new purified component out now. I, uh, it's omega-7. And I think it's palmitoleic acid. And I always associated that one with bad things because that's the saturated fat your body makes when you're having excessive carbohydrate, as per Professor Volokh's work. You know, the 16 one goes up. And then I thought, well, why would you take that as a supplement? And I realized, well, that's a signaling molecule. So it increases adiponectin and does a lot of beneficial things. So it could be a good thing, a very good thing to take omega-7. But ironically, in a twisted kind of a twist of irony, it's the bad fat that your body makes when you take excessive carbohydrate. And you know what may even make sense, Paul? When you're making a lot of palmitoleic acid because you're eating too much carbohydrate, which is causing lots of problems, it may then be signaling to try and reduce insulin resistance by the very fact of its own manufacture. It so just take it. Yeah. So just taking it separately, you get the anti-diabetic effects and the pro-adiponectin effects, but without eating the carb or doing a bad thing. So you're just getting a net positive. So that this whole area of... Um, you know, these compounds for enhancing health. I'm kind of getting a bit more interested now as we've pretty much tied down all of the food effects on health, I think, to our satisfaction to make a very healthy diet and lifestyle. I um, get a little more interested in those. There's some great uh, things I've read online about palmitoleic acid versus palmitate. And so <clears throat> these are both 16 carbon fatty acids, and one of them is an unsaturated fatty acid, and one of them is a saturated fatty acid. And my impression is that the adipocytes make palmitoleic acid under different conditions than when they make palmitate. And when they want the rest of the body to be insulin sensitive and to take up glucose, the adipocytes will make palmitoleic acid. 
when they want the rest of the body to be insulin resistant and to resist glucose, to spare glucose for the brain, they'll release palmitate. Now, this is, I'm using insulin resistance in a different, different context now. This is physiologic insulin resistance or glucose yeah. sparing, right? But it can happen under, it can be a little bit confusing. So I'm going to do a whole different podcast on physiologic insulin resistance and glucose sparing with Tommy Wood. I won't go into that in detail. I talked about that in detail in my previous podcast or one that may or may not have come out when this one comes out with the folks from Mastering Diabetes. But palmitoleic acid and palmitate are signaling molecules from the adipocytes. The Cliff Notes version is, is it, the way I see it is that insulin resistance in relation to food and calories is governed by the adipocyte. And if the adipocyte is full, meaning that if we eat carbohydrates and fat together, and the adipocyte is just absolutely chocked full of extra fat, it expands, it starts to release um, palmitate, which induces insulin resistance, right? But it, at the level of the muscle, but that is not necessarily what we want. That, that's, a, a, that's when the adipocyte is expanding. But we can also get the adipocyte releasing palmitate in low insulin states, right? Because if in a low mm -hmm. insulin state, the adipocyte is going to release palmitate because it's not seeing a lot of insulin signaling. It's the insulin signaling at the level of the adipocyte that determines whether it's going to release palmitoleic acid or palmitate. And there's a different condition that is often called physiologic insulin resistance or glucose sparing when we are low carb. And that's a very good thing. And that just happens at the level of the muscle. The, the adipocyte is not seeing insulin. The adipocyte is not expanding, right? And the insulin is not, it's not hyperinsulinemia, but it is not seeing insulin. So it releases palmitate, which signals to the muscle, refuse glucose, save glucose for testes, kidney, red blood cells, and brain, and use the ketones that are in the body. That is glucose sparing at the level of the muscle, which is a very different physiologic state than hyperinsulinemia insulin resistance in which the adipocyte sees lots mm -hmm. of insulin, but the adipocyte becomes resistant to that insulin signaling because it's already chock full. In that case, the adipocyte also releases palmitate, but that is uh, creating a negative effect at the level of the muscle. Then the muscle refuses glucose, and, but it's in a setting of hyperinsulinemia. So hopefully I didn't confuse people there, but palmitoleic acid and palmitate are fascinating signaling molecules. The take home message is that glucose sparing physiologic insulin resistance at the level of the muscle on a low carbohydrate diet is normal and healthy. And it's a very different physiologic condition than hyperinsulinemia and systemic insulin resistance at the level of the adipocyte and throughout the body. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that's cool. That's, that's, that's perfect. That's the thing. I mean, hyperinsulinemia with uh, coincident insulin resistance is the pathological problem. Exactly. Insulin resistance triggered and asked for by the body's control system to spare glucose is localized and appropriate. And uh, yeah, mixing the two up has confused people all right. So it's, it's no harm stressing each time and describing it as you say. Yeah. And then I, we can wrap up here. I want to respect your time, but I just want to highlight for people, there's been a lot of research recently on soybean oil that's come out and uh, the negative effects of soybean oil. There's one study here that I'll highlight for people dysregulation of the hypothalamic gene expression and oxytocinergic system by soybean oil diets in male mice. Again, soybean oil is one of these PUFAs. Well, it's an oil that contains many polyunsaturated fatty acids. And in your book, you discuss multiple other studies with soybean oil causing all sorts of problems. What is the majority of the American diet in terms of oils? It's soybean oil. And it actually has hormonal and cardiovascular negative effects. And what do they put? in uh, fake meat burgers, they definitely put soybean oil quite a bit of the time. So these are bad things, you guys, bad things. Well, my friend, thank you so much for coming on the show. This is an awesome conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, where can people find more of your work? Well, I think the easiest thing is Google Ivor or Ivor Cummins. Or Igor, and, no, uh, Ivor, <laughs> Ivor. <laughs> Yeah. And just Googling my name hits the YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook and the Fat Emperor website in the first page. So it's the easiest way to pick the stuff up. Uh, but the other thing I'd always ask people is I work for Irish Heart Disease Awareness, uh, the organization to promote knowledge about the calcium scan to save middle risk people, save lives, and also to explain the root causes. So people who get a high calcium score know what to do and take action beyond the meds and procedures they might need. So if people go to ihda.ie and could 
look at the homepage there and maybe share with the social media buttons down below. That'll really help us get the message out. That's the big ask. And coronary artery calcium scoring is, I think, a valuable tool. It's quite interesting. And um, I posted on my social media this last week. It's a young guy. So again, in a young person, the, it's not as valid, but he has an a LDL, which is often above 500 and a zero uh, coronary artery calcium score. Um, yeah. There are other people I've heard of. I think his LDL has been as high as 700 in the past. It's just not as simple. If we're worried about this, I think it's an it's a easy test to get. We should know what our LDL excuse me, what our CAC score is. And it's been used in the community now to track regression. And um, I went hunting recently and one of the guys on the hunting trip was telling me about his dad who'd reversed diabetes with a low carbohydrate diet. And they had seen regression of the CAC score, I think from like 430 to 350 over the course of six months or a year. So it was coming down. So how interesting is that, that on a high fat diet, a high saturated fat diet with higher LDL, you can get regression of your CAC. That's a pretty fascinating finding. Yeah. And actually, Paul, just a final note, we have a movie coming out. There'll probably be a Kickstarter soon, an Irish movie with 45 sports stars from the 90s that we scanned. And we've got a hero's journey in there and people who have experienced exactly what you just described. So that'll be controversial and it'll blow the lid off this somewhat. I love but it. What's it going to be called? Do we have a name? Extra Time is the very likely, likely working title, and mm. it's, it'll be a little, just an hour long and fairly fast-paced, uh, but we've scanned 45 sports stars in their late 50s now, and it's shocking what we saw. I mean, they were all declared to be healthy. They're still pretty fit, and nine out of the 45 had shocker scores, immediate follow-up with cardiologists. And then we followed a high score through the movie, so you'll get to see what actually happened but uh, it's going to be good. But the key thing with the calcification is absolutely regression is possible. Amazing stories out there now. We've got people with massive cholesterol with zero scores and clean arteries. It's a powerful tool. But the real thing we're trying to get out there for is to flag to the unsuspecting tofi or thin outside, fat inside right. person, middle age, middle risk. They're not sure to let them know if they've got big disease so they can take action before they drop dead of a heart attack and leave their family behind. So that's the real power of the calcium score for us at IHDA.ie. And the TOFI is essentially visceral mm. fat. It's the visceral yeah. adipose tissue. And you can see that also on a DEXA scan or uh, there are MRIs that are doing this now. Recently on social media, I challenged a vegan doctor to compare his VAT score to my VAT score. I'm pretty sure I don't have much visual adipose this year. <laughs> I know I've got more of a six pack than him, but uh, Garth Davis, I'm coming for you. Um, so, but yeah, I think it's so fascinating. And I think that, that that sort of like, you may not have, you may not be fat, but if you have visceral adipose tissue, those adipocytes are creating a state of insulin resistance in your body with this palmitate uh, you know, they're, they're full and you have something going on that you need to know about. And that, as we said, can be the real deciding factor in terms of where that LDL goes and that LDL can catch fire. And that's a big deal. But in general, as a summary, LDL must be interpreted in, in the context. They can't be interpreted in the vacuum. Raising levels of LDL on a ketogenic or carnivore diet are not a bad thing given we consider everything else. One of the best things I saw recently, Ivor, was somebody posted on Instagram that they had a question from a patient and the patient asked them, will my bad cholesterol go up on a ketogenic diet? And he said, you don't have bad cholesterol, you have bad information. I thought that was pretty great. <laughs> yeah. Right? That's really, yeah, that's a good note to end it, all right. Yeah, so last question I always ask people is, what hmm. is the most radical thing that you have done recently, my friend? Oh. I wow. often get that reaction, they're like, wow. This is like 80s Maybe. radical, like just something awesome, amazing, just something radical. <laughs> radical. Well, I, I've been to Tel Aviv. I went to a conference in November, which was fantastic, but that's not radical. Um, oh, I got in a Barney with uh, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick in the last week because he had an article very critical of CAC and uh, I reacted to it. So maybe messing with Malcolm, who's a buddy of mine, maybe messing with him too much is, is risky stuff. I don't know. <laughs> in short, Paul, I actually can't think of anything to hand, so I'm just throwing stuff out there. <laughs> well, a conference in Tel Aviv, all the work you do is radical, but hopefully the next time you are in the States, 
if you are in Southern California, we will go surfing and we will, we will do some radical things. We'll go jump in the ocean or something, man. Sounds great, Paul. Nice one. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Ivor. All right, you guys, you are radical. I appreciate you all. I'm just having a very appreciative moment for everybody that listened to this podcast. I love doing it. I get to do all kinds of cool stuff. I got to hang out with Tommy Wood, Lucy Mayling this past week, and it was amazing. I went to a conference in Scottsdale where I did a presentation on the carnivore diet, and we recorded it, and we recorded it with slides, and I'm going to post it on all my social media, and I'm going to post it on YouTube very soon, but it was really in-depth about the carnivore diet at the Physicians for Ancestral Health retreat, which was in Scottsdale in January. I hope some of you guys will show up. You don't have to be a doctor. But there's a lot of smart people there. You will learn a ton. And Tommy is my boy. We recorded a podcast. Man, I can't wait to share that one with you guys. Lucy Mailing, as you may know, is a brilliant PhD now. She completed her PhD. She may go to medical school. She may just stay as a brilliant PhD. But she writes all about microbiome. And we got into that in detail and talked about fiber in the microbiome. So that one is coming up too. You guys, my book comes out next month. And I am so, so stoked. Do I ever get stoked? Yes. Am I ever not stoked? Pretty much no. Pretty much always stoked. TheCarnivoreCodeBook.com. We are closing pre-orders now through the publisher, and we will be uh, putting it on Amazon, where we'll also probably have some ability to pre-order soon, but stay tuned for that in the next few days. And also, I'm on The Doctors this week. I'm on The Doctors. The Doctors TV show comes out on the 30th. Check me out there if you're listening to this. I don't even know how many people listen to the end of this episode. But tell your friends to listen, because I put good stuff here sometimes. I got a t-shirt. Check that out on my website. And stay tuned for next week, guys. I'm probably going to release... Uh, the episode with Lucy Mailing or Tommy Wood next week. They are so hot. They are burning a hole in my hard drive. Check out The Doctors. It's on the 30th of this month. Check out my book. Support me there. I appreciate you all. Ooh, guess what else? I'm recording with Lauren Cordain soon. We're going to get him on the podcast, talk all about the paleo diet, what he thinks of the carnivore diet at all. It'll be really good. Keep your questions coming, guys. Send me questions. Dr. Paul at Carnivore MD. Send me requests. Let me know what you want to hear. Let me know who you want to have on the podcast. And please leave me a review on iTunes. And please subscribe to my newsletter called The Fundamental Health Insider, where I talk about all kinds of radical stuff. So anyway, that is it, you guys. Stay radical. I appreciate you all. Please leave me a review. Please stay radical. Please go jump in the ocean. Please go go in a sauna. Please go do handstands and play with your children and eat the best meat on the planet from Belcampo and White Oak. And let me know about it. All right. Love you all. Love you all.